Hello, my name's Richard. Um, I'm a, a retired medical doctor. My full name is Dr. Richard Kent, and I operate out of a charity. And for the next 60 minutes, we're going to talk about what does God think about abortion. Now, the Bible doesn't say anything about abortion, so we've got to use our conscience and various other things, particularly what the Bible says about life in the womb, to decide what God thinks about abortion. And I'm going to have to ask you to make your own mind up what God thinks about abortion. Um, I actually work very closely with a consultant gynaecologist who lives in Pakistan. Her name is Dr. Tahira Saleem. Um, she's a consultant obstetrician, consultant gynaecologist. She's an ordained Bible teacher, and she actually um, runs one of the largest Christian churches in Pakistan, where I work. Um, and she and I have worked together to produce this presentation. In Pakistan, abortions are illegal, uh, and she has quite strong views about abortions. However, uh, that's, the, that's, the, um, that's the hospital where uh, Tahira lives, uh, works, Calvary Hospital in Lahore. Um, I'm a retired medical doctor. I retired from medicine about 12 years ago. And that's my wife, who's much more attractive than I am, as you can see. And our charity, we give completely free PowerPoint conferences anywhere in the world. And, these, and uh, this, this uh, 60 minute uh, teaching is going to be on a DVD, which can be copied and distributed entirely free from the following websites. Uh, finalfrontier.org.uk, freechristianteaching.org, and also be uploaded onto video.google.com, where you can watch it and download it free and distribute it free. Um, now this is a, one of a series of 12 teachings, and here are the other teachings, which are also obtainable free. Uh, what happens after we die? Evangelism is easy. Creation, the Genesis account. Evolution is impossible. The discovery of Noah's, Noah's Ark, Sodom and Gomorrah, the Exodus crossing, Mount Sinai, and the Ark of the Covenant. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the Shroud of Turin proves the resurrection. The Bible is supernatural. What does God think about abortion? The pre-tribulation rapture of all Christians in our lifetime. God's perfect plan for our finances and how to have a miracle. So those are the 12 subjects you can see on our two free website. Um, there's for further information on what does, what does God think about abortions on our two websites. And all information and images are intended to be used under the fair use clause of the copyright laws. Um, we've actually used information from various churches in UK, Wharton Church on the web. Uh, we've used pictures of Jesus from the Visual Bible with permission. Um, and basically, uh, we have permission for virtually everything that's said on here. <coughs> um, now, the, the Bible says in the Ten Commandments, you shall not murder. That's what God said in Exodus 20, verse 13. Now, the question we need to ask over the next 60 minutes is when does human life begin? Is a fetus in the womb a blob of disposable cells, or is the, is the, is the little baby in the womb actually a human being? Is the fetus in the womb a separate and distinct human life, and what does God think about abortions? Well, let's see what the Bible actually says. Now, I have to be honest, the word abortion doesn't appear in the Bible, <clears throat> so that's why I can't tell you exactly what God thinks about abortions, because the Bible doesn't say. That's why you and I, all of us, have to decide on the weight of evidence from what the Bible actually teaches about life in the womb, what we think God does think about abortion. Now, there are lots of other subjects about which the Bible is also silent. I'm not going to go into them all, but there are quite a number of them. And, and we have to treat abortion in the same case, as, in the same way as we teach all these other subjects. We just have to see what the weight of evidence from the Bible is, and then carefully think about it, maybe pray about it, and then every person must come to their own conclusion. So I'm not going to tell you what you should think, um, wh whether abortions are right or wrong. Um, I'm not going to be able to tell you what God thinks about abortions, but I'm going to give you some pretty strong clues, I hope. Now, the teaching from the early Christian church um, is, amongst other places, in the Didache. And the Didache is an ancient document containing Christian doctrines from before 150 AD. And here's an extract from the Didache. You shall not kill a child by abortion, nor slay it when born. So the early church had very clear teaching. Uh, we don't have that now. Now, when, we, when uh, we're conceived in the womb, uh, this is actually a miracle, and I'm going to be talking now about what actually happens in, the in, in our 
in the womb, in our mum's tummy, when we're conceived and when we develop over nine months. It really is an absolute miracle to develop from a, a fertilized egg to a, nine, uh, a baby at nine months, weighing six, seven, eight pounds, nine pounds sometimes. So, we're going to start with the development of the baby in the womb. And the baby develops from conception. Um, the baby, I believe, life starts conception. I'll be able to prove that to you from the scriptures later on. Uh, the human baby spends uh, roughly 40 weeks developing in the womb, and this is normal progression of life from conception to birth and then on to childhood. And I'm over 60 now, and I don't look anything like a little baby anymore because we all change. And we changed in the womb as well. We changed from a, from a tiny little um, fertilized egg about the size of a grain of salt, and we changed into a baby weighing eight, nine pounds, and now we change to what we are now. Now, the, um, I'm not going to go into detail that, that slide. That's rather a complicated slide. Uh, but basically, the eggs are produced, uh, are released, I should say, from the ovaries. And all ladies have a certain finite number of ovaries. And once a month, these um, eggs are released um, halfway through the cycle, usually around about day 14. And if fertilization takes place, it happens in what's called the fallopian tube. It's a tube leading, leading from the ovary to the womb. So fertilization actually happens there. And then the fertilized egg passes down the fallopian tube towards the uterus, which is the womb, and then implants in the wall of the uterus. And this is all controlled by a very complicated hormonal system, um, controlled by our brains, by hypothalamus, and by follicle stimulating hormone released by the fertilized egg, and so on. And I won't go into all the details of that, but it is very com quite complicated. Now that's an amazing electron microscope photo photograph of actually fertilization taking place. At conception, the beginning of human life, one sperm joins with the ovum, that's the egg, to form one cell which is smaller than a grain of salt. So it's very, very small. Now, in the first week, the new life has inherited 23 chromosomes from the father and 23 chromosomes from the mother. That makes a total of 46 chromosomes. And that's what a baby looks like at conception. In the first week, this single cell, the fertilized ovum, <coughs> is completely separate and distinct from the mother's body and the mother's cells. <coughs> Sorry. The new life is completely different from the mother's life. The new fertilized ovum already has its his or her own genetic DNA coding. So I have genetic DNA coding. That's the, the, Im, the um, genetic code that God used to make my human body. But baby has different genetic code. And you can see there how the, uh, the baby is implanted into the wall of the womb um, and develops a placenta. That's how the, the placenta is the way that the, uh, the, the baby is attached to the wall of the womb, called the endometrium. And the baby develops in a little embryonic sac there, full of amni amniotic fluid. So the fertilized egg travels down the fallopian tube into the uterus, where the lining of the uterus has been prepared for implantation into the uterus. And nourishment for the little baby is provided by the mother through the umbilical cord. You can see the umbilical cord on the right there. It's a long, thin cord, and it has to be tied off when, when the baby is born. Um, the baby's blood system and the mother's blood system are quite separate and distinct. Um, and oxygen and all the necessary building elements and nutrients are transferred to the baby via the umbilical cord. It's absolutely an amazing miracle. The whole thing is just stunning, actually. It's absolutely miraculous. Now, weeks two to five, the developing baby signals his or her presence through special placental chemicals and hormones, preventing the mother from having a monthly period. So baby, at a very early stage, says, I'm here. And during these three weeks, first the brain, spinal cord, and nervous systems are formed. And then the heart begins to beat, and muscles, limbs, ears, and eyes begin to show. And the, baby, the baby's body is being carefully made by God according to the design on the baby's genetic code, the DNA, or the desoxyribonucleic acid, which is its genetic code that God uh, designed before the creation of the world for all of us to be designed according to the way he wanted us to be. 
Weeks four to seven, the placenta forms a unique barrier that keeps the mother's blood separate whilst allowing food and oxygen to pass through to the baby. Five fingers can be discerned in each hand and brain waves can be detected and recorded. The brain begins to control movements of muscles and organs and the liver is now taking over the production of blood cells. So quite a lot happens in the first four to seven weeks. Weeks seven to 11, the, by now the, the baby is about an inch long and the developed baby is now officially called a fetus. Now that Latin word fetus actually means offspring or young one, that's what it means. Um, so I know doctors and nurses and medical people generally, um, textbooks like to talk about fetus, but what they're actually talking about is an offspring or a young one. So the baby has now developed by 11 weeks and the baby has now everything that will be found in a fully developed adult. The stomach produces digestive juices and the kidneys have begun to function. The baby's body now responds to touch and baby can curve his, his or her little fingers around an object placed in the palm of his hand or her hand. So baby is fully developed but very, very small. So from week 11, the baby, the baby now has lots and lots of senses. Four senses of vision, hearing, taste and touch. And baby can even recognize his or her mother's voice. By the way, baby gets to know mum's voice very well. You would do if you were living in mummy's tummy for nine months. But here's a word for dads too. Talk to baby for the nine months because as soon as baby appears, if you've spent enough time talking to baby, then baby will know you as well as he knows mum, or she knows mum. During this time, antibodies build up increasingly and the skin thickens with a layer of fat stored underneath it for insulation and nourishment. From now on, baby just gets bigger. Uh, weeks 11 to 20, the baby now sleeps, wakes up and exercises its muscles energetically, turning its head, curling its toes and opening and closing his mouth. The palm when stroke will make a tight fist. The baby breathes amniotic fluid to help develop its respiratory system. And sexual differentiation has become apparent, so you can tell whether we've got a little boy or a little girl. At the end of this period, the baby is eight to 10 inches long and weighs about half a pound. That's by 20 weeks. Now, weeks 17 to 25, the baby jumps in response to external sounds and oil and sweat glands begin to function. If the baby were born at the end of this period, at 25 weeks, he would survive given proper care. Actually, nowadays, they can actually have babies surviving in incubators even at 22 weeks. Weeks 25 to 40, baby grows bigger during these weeks and most babies, 85 to 95% of babies are born between 38 and 42 weeks. And most babies weigh six to nine pounds. So baby at 36 weeks looks like that on the left and baby at birth looks something like that on the, on the, on the right. So baby's developing in, in, in mummy's tummy and most babies develop in the head down position but sometimes they uh, present the other way up and that's called a breech presentation. But we won't, needn't go into all the obstetrics of all this. Um, so, but I would emphasize that to develop from a tiny egg to a newborn baby in the womb in nine months really is a miracle. So we've all had at least one miracle, all of us, being, being formed in our mother's stomach, mother's tummy. Now, here are some ultrasound scans of babies in the womb. These are called four-dimensional scans. Um, they're amazing. Uh, if you go onto my website, you can see some more. Amazing ultrasound scans of babies in the womb. And you can actually see live ultrasound scan scans, moving ones, in other words. Um, and Professor Campbell uh, pioneered all this work. And this is what he says. From 12 weeks, unborn babies can stretch, kick, and leap around the womb. From 18 weeks, they can open their eyes. And from 26 weeks, they appear to exhibit a whole range of typical baby behavior and moods, including scratching, smiling, crying, hiccuping, and sucking, all sorts of things that little babies do uh, as soon as they come out into the world. But they've been doing that from 26 weeks in the womb. Now, the Bible says that God knows each one of us bef from before the creation of the universe. He knows each one of us from before the creation of the universe. We have uh, separate teachings on creation and evolution, and I'd love you to watch them. They're all free. Um, but God knows each one of us before he created the universe. And that's what it teaches in Ephesians chapter 1. And this is what it says. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places with Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Just to emphasize there, that God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. That's an amazing thing to think about, that God chose you and me before he created the universe. Now, God designed each one of us uh, according to our DNA, which is our design codes in every cell of our bodies. And we've got about three trillion cells, and every single cell's got, got this, he this helix in it, uh, which is our DNA, our desoxyribonucleic acid, and it ha has the very complex genetic blueprint for all physical development and all the necessary information to build a baby. That's how the miracle happens in the womb. God is building this baby according to the design code. When you build a house, you get the architects to, to do a plan. Well, your plan is inbuilt in all your cells. And the information in the DNA includes information about construction of the brain, the heart, the liver, the circulatory system, skeleton, and everything else. And there's masses and masses of information on that DNA. It's the most powerful stor storage medium on the planet. Now, it's interesting to note, just in passing, there's not a single instance of any computer software on any computer on planet Earth that got there by chance. I'm using a computer right now. And uh, this software on this computer didn't get there by chance, any more than yours did. Your DNA in your cells didn't get there by chance. No, God put it there. God put it there. He designed each one of us, and he chose us before the foundation of the world. The Bible says in Psalm 139, For you did form my inward parts. You did knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We are wonderfully made in the womb. It's absolutely fantastic what happens in the womb. In other words, God made you and me in our mother's womb. And we're little people, not fetuses in our mother's womb, being wonderfully made according to our genetic design code, our DNA. Now, this is Sir Fred Hoyle, who's a Nobel Prize winning scientist in the UK. He got the Nobel, Pri uh, Nobel Prize for um, discovering the redshift and many other things as well. And this is what he has to say. The likelihood of the formation of life from inanimate matter is one to a number of 40,000 noughts after it. It was enough to bury Darwin in the whole theory of evolution. There was no primeval soup, neither on this planet nor on any other, and if the beginning of the and if the beginnings of life were not random, they must therefore have been the product of a purposeful intelligence. Now, that's what we would call God. That's what the Bible calls God. So Fred Cole uses the words, a purposeful intelligence. He also calculated that the odds of only the proteins of uh, an amoeba, that's on the right there, that's an amoeba, arising by chance is one chance in 10 with 40,000 noughts after it, which is a colossal number. In other words, life never evolved by chance. Now we're going to look at actually individuals in their mother's womb, individuals in scripture in their mother's womb. Jeremiah in the Old Testament, this is what it says in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 3, before I formed you in the womb, this is God talking, God says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah was a prophet, and God chose him before, um, before the creation of the world. So God knows all about all of us long before we are formed in the womb. And he also sanctifies, sanctifies us before we are formed in the womb. Let's now look at Job in his mother's womb. Well, in his mother's womb, in Job chapter 10, he's described as, as, as me, or a little person. Job asks this question in, jo in Job chapter 10, verse 18. Why then have you brought me out of the womb? Why have you brought me out of the womb? In um, Job 31, this is what um, Job says. Did not he, that's God, who made me in the mother's womb make them? Did not the same one God fashion us in the womb? There's, there's Job asking this question. Let's look at Jacob and Esau in Rebekah's womb. Well, the Bible describes Jacob and Esau in Rebekah's womb. They're described as children, not fetuses. In Genesis 25, it says the children struggled together within her. And uh, Jacob was very much a little person in his mother's womb. In fact, it says in Hosea chapter 12, verse 3, it says, He, that's Jacob, took his brother's heel, 
in the womb. So Jacob had a brother in the womb. That's called, and he was called Esau. So they had names in their, in, in their mother's womb. God knows all about us and he gives us names in our mother's wombs. Now we're going to study John the Baptist. Very interesting, we're going to look at Jesus after that, but John the Baptist in his mother's womb. Now, you probably know the story. Zachariah was a priest in the temple and his wife Elizabeth had never had a child. She was very elderly. We don't know exactly how old they were, but they were very elderly. That's what it says in Luke chapter 1, verse 7. So one day, Zachariah was attending to his duties as a priest in the temple. Now this is what it says in Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 11. It says, The angel Gabriel appeared to him in the, temp to him in the temple, and this is what he said. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. So that is uh, Gabriel announcing that uh, Elizabeth, who is elderly, is going to have a supernatural conception and have a baby called John. We call him John the Baptist. So the angel Gabriel described John the Baptist in his mother's womb like this. For he will be great and distinguished in the sight of the Lord, and he must drink no wine nor strong drink, and he will be filled with and controlled by the Holy Spirit even in and from his mother's womb. So John the Baptist was controlled by the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. Very important. Um, so so we, we must make a note of how John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit even in his mother's womb before he was actually born. So obviously baby John the Baptist was very important to God even in Elizabeth's womb. Actually we're all very important to God in our mother's wombs. Every single baby on this planet is important to God in their mother's womb. Now later the same Gabriel appeared to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and said this, Thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And by this time, uh, John was six months old and looked something like that picture at the bottom there. Note that Gabriel, had, uh, Gabriel the angel, Gabriel said that Elizabeth had conceived not a fetus, but a son. And a son begins at conception. Now, what would happen to baby John the Baptist in hospitals today? Well, I used to be a medical doctor. I worked for 30 years as a medical doctor. And I'm not sure exactly what would happen, but I'll just put this to you. Elizabeth, we're told, was very elderly. We don't know how old she was. She was almost certainly past her menopause, which normally happens around the age of 50. Um, she, was, uh, she may have been much older than that. In many countries, Elizabeth would have been advised by doctors to have an abortion because of the statistical greater risk to the fetus of, of various nasty diseases. E examples, uh, statistically, are Down syndrome, spina bifida, spina, bi spina bifida, and encephaly and lots of other nasty diseases. I won't go into them all here. But the thing is that people who are very elderly who, who, who are pregnant, ladies who are pregnant who are elderly, are, are recommended to have an abortion. So what would have happened to John the Baptist, the second most important person in the New Testament? Well, he would have been aborted probably in many hospitals today. And that's a very frightening thought, isn't it? Because, you know, John the Baptist is supremely important to God and yet and uh, many doctors would advise uh, the elderly Elizabeth to have an abortion. What about Jesus in Mary's womb? <clears throat> uh, we don't know with any certainty the date of Jesus' birth, but um, lots of uh, dates have been proposed by different Bible scholars, and I actually have no idea exactly when Jesus was born. I've got some ideas, but I don't know that I'm right. But just for the purposes of this presentation, we've just got to choose a date. So I've chosen a date that some people say might be right. I don't know if they are right, but it's just we've got to choose a date. So I've chosen September of 3 BC, which as I say is a date often quoted by scholars. Right, there you have a chart, and on the right there you can see that in the, the year 3 BC, let's say that Jesus was born in se September of 3 BC, which means he was conceived nine months earlier, and that would have been December of 4 BC. I hope I've got you there. Um, you understand where I'm going? Jesus was born in September 3 BC, and nine months earlier he was conceived. So we're now looking at December of 4 BC. So uh, se September 3 BC, he was uh, conceived by the Holy Spirit. Uh, sorry, September 3 BC was born and conceived by the Holy Spirit 
uh, December of 4 BC, and we're going to look very carefully to what actually happened. We're told that when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary, that John the Baptist was already six months old. This is what it says in Luke. Luke was a medical doctor, and this is what it says in Luke chapter 1, verse 36. Thy cousin Elizabeth, she has she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. So John, at this stage, was six months old. So now we can actually plot, roughly, when John was conceived. If John was six months old in December of 4 BC, he was conceived six months earlier, and that would have been June of 4 BC. All right? So in December of 4 BC, John the Baptist looked like the top picture, six months old, and baby Jesus looked like that, uh, a newly fertilized egg, just conceived in, in Mary's womb. Now, in December of 4 BC, Joseph and Mary were ready to be married. It was a long betrothal in those days, and they lived in Nazareth. Now, that's what Nazareth looks like today. I've been there many times. Um, that's what Nazareth looks like today. It doesn't look like, I'm sure it didn't look like that when Jesus was born, but nevertheless, um, that's where they were living. Of course, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but at the time, uh, Joseph and Mary were living in Nazareth. And Gabriel said to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. That's in Luke chapter 1, verse 35. Now, that was in fulfillment of the prophecy given in Isaiah chapter 7. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now notice that Virgin Mary, would, she would conceive and bear a son, and not a fetus, and his name would be Emmanuel. Now in Matthew, we're told, in that chapter 1, verse 18, we're told, the f this is what it says, these are the facts concerning the birth of Jesus Christ. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, Joseph, Joseph her fiancé, being a man of stern principle, decided to break the engagement, but to do it quietly, as he didn't want to publicly disgrace her. So she became pregnant, and they were only betrothed. They were only engaged, in other words. Um, and it says, and he, Joseph, lay awake considering this, and he fell into a dream and saw an angel standing beside him. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, don't hesitate to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her, not the fetus, the child within her has been conceived by the Holy Spirit. Notice that Gabriel says that Mary has conceived a child, not a fetus. And Gabriel is referring to the newly conceived baby Jesus as a child even at conception. Now we're going to look and see what Mary would have felt at this stage and what would be the most natural thing for her to do. Now she was really frightened, I suspect. I don't know that, it doesn't say that in the Bible, but I want you to consider. You see, um, the penalty for sex outside marriage, um, Mary hadn't actually got married at this stage, she was betrothed. But um, the penalty for sex outside marriage was stoning to death. There's an example of that in John chapter 8. Now, Joseph didn't presumably initially believe Mary's story, so why would anybody else believe Mary's story? So Mary was in fear of her life. She was frightened of being stoned to death as soon as people discovered she was pregnant. Now, Mary may have waited for um, two, three, four weeks until she had missed her monthly period, but probably she didn't. She'd had a supernatural pregnancy. She was a virgin, Mary, and she had conceived, um, and Joseph had nothing whatever to do with it. Um, she urgently wanted to talk to somebody else who'd had a supernatural pregnancy, and who could possibly that be? Well, it was obviously there's only one choice. It was her cousin, Elizabeth, because she also had had a supernatural pregnancy. So off she went to see Elizabeth. Now, Zachariah and Elizabeth, they lived in Judea, which is not a long way away from Jerusalem from um, Nazareth, but that's where they went. And why I'm telling you all this is that I want you to notice what actually happened when they met. So Mary went to visit Elizabeth, her cousin, in Judea, probably in January 3 BC, if, if um, Mary waited, but probably even earlier. So Mary left her home in Nazareth and traveled to her cousin Elizabeth in Judea. Mary went to see Elizabeth in January 3 BC, depending on how long Mary waited, 
Um, and then baby Jesus Christ at four weeks in January 3 BC would have looked something like this at four weeks old. But it could have been uh, earlier than that. He might have been two weeks or even less. Now, when Mary arrived, baby John, that aged six months old, in Elizabeth's womb, it says he leapt for joy. And this is what it says in Luke chapter 1. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with Holy Spirit. So baby John the Baptist leapt in Elizabeth's womb, and Elizabeth herself was filled with the Holy Spirit. So, very exciting time for John because the Messiah, Jesus Christ, had come within a few feet of him and he leapt for joy, and something else happened. Elizabeth, the elderly lady, she had been filled with the Holy Spirit and she prophesied, and under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, this is what she said. And it's recorded in Luke chapter 1, verse 43, and these are very important words. This is what Elizabeth said to Mary, Blessed are you amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. For why is this granted unto me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Mary is addressing Jesus Christ in Mary's womb, aged probably two weeks, certainly less than four weeks old, and says that this little baby is my Lord. So Jesus is re referred to under the anointing of the Holy Spirit at two weeks old, or a maximum of four weeks, as my Lord. And that's a very, very profound thing to find in the scriptures. So Elizabeth was saying that baby Jesus, four weeks old, was my Lord, not a fetus. So what can we conclude from that? Well, we can conclude that Jesus Christ's life started at conception. At conception, he was described as a child in Matthew chapter 1. And at four weeks old, or possibly younger, he was described by Elizabeth as my Lord. Conclusion, Jesus Christ's life started at conception, and that actually is the life when, that is the time when the life of every baby starts, and we'll prove that to you from the scriptures. Now, what would have happened to baby Jesus in hospitals today? Well, remember, Mary was not married. In the culture of Mary's society in Israel, she would probably have been stoned to death. But she was betrothed to Joseph, but said that Joseph was not the father. She would have gone along to see the doctor, possibly, um, and announced that Joseph was not the father, but that the Holy Spirit was. Well, what happens today to young ladies, young ladies um, who get pregnant before they're married? Well, it could well, have, well be that um, Mary would have, been, have advised that Jesus Christ should be aborted which is a terrible thing to say, but that probably is the truth. In fact, it gets worse. What, have hap what, have hap what, uh, what would have happened to Virgin Mary in most countries today as well? What would have happened to, to her? Well, she claimed she was visited by the angel Gabriel, and the father of the baby was Jesus Christ. Sorry, the father of baby Jesus was the Holy Spirit. Not Joseph, but the Holy Spirit. Now, if you go and see your GP, your, your, your normal medical practitioner and say that the, your conception is not by your boyfriend or, or the man to whom you're betrothed, but by God himself, the Holy Spirit, what is your doctor going to think? Well, I submit to you that your doctor will probably send you to see a psychiatrist and even admit you to the hospital for mentally ill. Anyway, what is the result of all this? The result of all this is that baby Jesus and John the Baptist in today's society would probably be aborted, and that's a terrible thing to have to say. Now, life begins at conception according to the Bible. So we're going to look now at biblical definitions of life and death. First of all, we're going to see example of, examples of death in the Bible. The biblical definition of death is when the human spirit leaves the body. When Jesus died on the cross, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. That was in Luke chapter 23. And, and as he breathed his last, it said the spirit of Jesus Christ left his body and he died. Now we're told in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 um, that when we die, it says that the dust returns to the earth, that's our body, the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. You see, we're two parts. We are a body made of 17 elements with an indwelling spirit. 
and the spirit returns to God who gave it and after and it says in the book of Hebrews it's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment now uh, Jesus had a brother called James, a half-brother really, and this is what he says in James chapter 2, verse 26, the body without the spirit is dead. In other words, without the indwelling spirit, the body is dead. No human life can exist without the indwelling spirit. So the Bibli now let's look at the biblical definition of life. The biblical definition of life is when the human spirit enters the body, and that's what happened in Genesis chapter 2. The Lord God is actually Jesus Christ. And it says, the Lord God for man of the dust of the ground, we're made of 17 elements, the Lord God for man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. So an uh, inanimate uh, body com uh, constructed uh, of 17 elements by our design code, our DNA, once you breathe a spirit into it, it comes to life again. It comes to life, and that's the original creation of Adam. Now, interestingly, again, Dr. Luke, Dr. Luke seems to be chosen for pointing all these important things out. In Luke chapter 8, there was a little girl called Jairus' daughter who died. And Jesus Christ rose that, uh, prayed, and, and that little girl came back to life again. And Jesus said, little girl, arise. And it says, her spirit returned and she arose immediately. In other words, when the, when the spirit of that little girl, Jairus' daughter, when the spirit re-entered her dead body, she came back to life. So when the spirit enters the body, when the spirit enters the body, the body comes back to life. In Ecclesiastes 11, we're told something really, really very important. This is verse 5. God's ways are as mysterious as the pathway of the wind and as the manner in which a human spirit is infused into the little body of a baby while it is yet in its mother's womb. The Bible teaches we're spirits living in bodies and without that indwelling spirit, the body is dead. Remember that the Bible teaches in Ecclesiastes 11 that that, that spirit is, is breathed into the body of a little baby in its mother's womb. And the, that, that, that little baby contains two things. Contains the DNA, the gen genetic design code from mother and father, but also the spirit, which is essential for life, or that baby would die. Remember, remember Jesus' half-brother James said, the body without the spirit is dead. So, when does life start? Well, it obviously starts at conception, because if the spirit wasn't there, that, that, that little conceived egg would be dead because it hasn't got a spirit in it. So my, human life must start at conception. It took me quite a long time to work all this out, but nevertheless, I'm sure that is the truth. Life starts at conception. Life starts at conception. Human life begins at conception. Your life and my life started at conception. A fertilized human egg is a human life precious in the sight of God. That little baby, newborn baby, um, we'll say he's six months old, and that's what we say, he's six months old. Actually, he's not six months old, he's 15 months old because his life started at conception. Here's a little girl aged four and a half years old, but actually she's not four and a half years old at all. She's five years and three months old because her life started at conception. Now, what does God think about abortion of little babies? The answer is, I don't know. But I have a conscience, and so do you. And I'm going to ask you to use your conscience, make your own mind up, because the Bible doesn't say. What the Bible does say is this. In him, Jesus Christ, was life, and the life was the light of men. That means that Jesus himself is the literal giver of life. You have life, and I have life, because Jesus Christ gave us that life. It's our spirit living in our body. What does God think about abortion? Well, the Bible says God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. The Ten Commandments says you shall not murder. The Bible doesn't say anything about abortion at all, but I want you to use your knowledge of the Bible and your conscience, which is the Holy Spirit quietly speaking in your heart to your, to your spirit, and we, we want you to ask you to discern for yourself what God thinks about abortion. Remember that God said you shall not murder. 
according to your conscience, not mine, according to your conscience, what does God think about abortion? And remember about popular opinion. Don't be swayed by the crowds. This is what it says in Ecclesiastes 12. But my son, be warned, there is no end of opinions ready to be expressed. Studying them can go on forever and become very exhausting. That's what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 12. Don't be swayed by public opinion. I'm well aware that the, I live in the United Kingdom and abortion, abortion is perfectly legal in this country, and I'm not going to go down that route. Um, in the end, there is only one opinion that actually matters. Jesus said, do not fear those who can... Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now that's a very powerful thing, isn't it? We don't need to be worried about what everybody else thinks because there's only one opinion that actually matters. There's only one judgment that actually really, really matters, and that's God's judgment because he can send us to hell. That's what Jesus said. There is a judgment after death. This is what it says in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. Sorry. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. That's Jesus, of course. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus is the giver of life in the womb. So if people take the uh, life of a baby in the womb, who are we responsible to? Well, according to the scriptures, we're responsible to the person who gave it, and that's Jesus. There is a judgment coming, it says in Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed for men to die once, but after that, the judgment. Big warning in Ecclesiastes, judge will, God will judge us. This is what it says in Ecclesiastes 12. Here is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commands, for this is the entire duty of man, for God will judge us for everything we do, including every hidden thing, good or bad. God will judge us. Um, God knows everything about us. God is a spirit and he's, and he's omnipresent. Um, for Christians, his Holy Spirit lives in us, but God knows all about us, and he will judge us for everything we do. Let me ask the question, why is there such confusion about abortions? Because People are really confused about abortions because on the one hand, in many countries, not in Pakistan where I work, uh, where abortions are illegal, but in many countries, abortions are legal. But that creates confusion because we have consciences and our consciences um, sometimes are at odds with what the system dictates. Jesus said the devil is a murderer, a liar, and the father of all lies. Jesus said, you belong to your father the devil and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. Now, it says here, Jesus said that the devil is a murderer. And we know from the scriptures that the devil likes to murder babies. He, he loved... He, uh, at the time of the birth of Jesus, there were a lot of babies um, killed under two, the age of two. And uh, when Moses was born, similarly, lots of male babies were thrown into the Nile. So Satan likes to kill, the devil likes to kill babies. What happens to babies and little children after they die? That's a very good question. Well, Jesus made it quite clear, fortunately. Jesus loves children. He said in Matthew 19, Let the little children come to me and don't hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Matthew 18, Jesus said, See that you do not look down on one of these little ones, for I tell you that, that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. So God says, well, through Jesus Christ, who is God, God says the angels of the little children are always in the presence of, of his Father in heaven. Now, uh, in 2 Samuel 12, we're told about David who had a, a child that died. And after he prayed for a little while, the child didn't come back to life, he stopped praying and um, they, they asked him about this and he said, this is what David said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I fast? 
can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. So David was quite clear where this child was. That little child is in heaven. I've got a sister who died at childbirth. I've never met her, but I will meet her in heaven, and I'm looking forward to it. My father's in heaven, my mother's in heaven, and very soon, I believe the Lord's coming back, and I'll be in heaven too, and we'll all be reunited. Conclusion, all babies, aborted babies, all little children who die, they all go to heaven, because God loves the little children. So, what age does somebody stop becoming a little child? Well, the answer is I don't know, but I've got a suggestion which you might like to consider. At what age does a child become accountable? Well, the Bible doesn't say, but it could possibly be at the bar mitzvah at the age of 13 for boys and the age 12 for girls, and that roughly responds to puberty. At bar mitzvah, the, bar, the word bar mitzvah means son of the law. In other words, a, a child be becomes responsible unto the law at the age of 13 for a little boy and 12 for a girl. Now, I'm not saying that that is correct. I don't know that's correct. It might be, and I'll just leave that with you. Now, here's a sensitive area, and I'm not going to say very much about it, is birth control or contraception for Christians. This is a very delicate area, and I do suggest you get some very sensible advice about this. There's a very good book called Birth Control for Christians. It's not expensive. It's called Making Wise Choices, Birth Control for Christians. Um, I got my copy on Amazon.co.uk, and um, I'm not trying to sell you anything. You can buy your own copy, or perhaps might, even your local library will have it, Amazon.co.uk or Amazon.com, or you can get any bookshop to order it for you. And I suggest if you're a Christian and you want to know about these things, I suggest you read this book or something similar. Please do your own research. This is a very sensitive area, and I don't want to give you any advice on this particular subject. You, See your own GP about it, but I will say this, my personal view, not shared by lots of doctors, not shared by some of my former colleagues, but my personal view is that the critical factor is whether conception has occurred, because I believe from the scriptures that life begins at conception. So if conception has occurred, then in my view we're dealing with a baby, not a blob of cells. Now I'm not going to go into all the various um, details of contraception, but bear that in mind. If you believe that life starts at conception, that will probably affect what particular type of contraceptive you choose to use. Uh, what, what should Christians do about the issue of abortion? Now this is a delicate subject, and it's a very difficult subject. And I've been speaking about abortion for about 30 years, and I've actually had more trouble on this issue than any of the other subjects I deal, I deal with. In, I'll give you an example. I once was asked um, by the Bishop of Chelmsford to speak in a large hall, and uh, there were about 400 people there, and there was a riot which had to be cleared by the police. That's how strongly people feel on this issue. It's a very, very contentious subject. People feel very strongly both ways. I don't want to upset people. I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. At least I hope I'm not. I'm, um, I think... Um, a lot of people um, get involved with abortions one way or another because they simply don't understand what the Bible has to say on the subject, or alternatively, they don't think the Bible is a very uh, is an is important source of knowledge. Um, so I'm certainly not pointing fingers and I'm not accusing anybody of anything. Well, the first thing is Jesus taught us to love our enemies and pray for them. Now there are some issues about which I'm actually quite. Uh, strongly worded. For example, I think evolutionists, people who teach that the universe created itself and life evolved by chance, I speak quite strongly towards them. I'm not rude, but I speak quite strongly. But I do not speak strongly on this subject to people who had abortions. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't speak uh, strongly to about I don't speak st strongly to people who've had abortions or, or in any way involved with abortions. Um, I try to love them and pray for them, which is very different, because Jesus said in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. We should try and love them and pray for them and try and be gentle and loving towards them. And, you know, if you love them and pray for them, they're not going to have a big problem with you. At least I hope you're not going to. That includes love and prayer, and now it specifically excludes verbal abuse and physical abuse. I'm sure you've heard about various people in different countries who actually do silly things um, 
which includes verbal abuse and physical abuse. And just don't go there, because the Bible specifically says, don't do that. Jesus actually loved sinful people. With very rare exceptions, he did, did love sinful people and prayed for sinful people, and we should do the same. There are many people who will not agree with what I'm saying here. Um, you may not like me, but I'm going to try my best to love whoever you are and to pray for you. I'm not going to be rude about you. I'm not going to make representations about you. And I'm not going to do anything at all other, other than give this presentation and appeal to various people's consciences because no abuse of any kind is permitted at all. Jesus said, don't judge. He says, judge not that you be not judged. Jesus said, don't judge anybody. I am not judging here. It may sound as if I'm judging, but I'm not. Jesus told us not to judge people and not to accuse anybody of anything. I've been very careful with my words, and I'm not judging people who've had abortions. I'm not judging people who do abortions either. I'm just trying to appeal to people's consciences and also perhaps educate people about life in the womb. Christians can present their case about abortion without accusing people. They can be calm, they can be calm and respectful and be polite. But they often will be um, rejected, I'm afraid. I've experienced that, certainly. I must try not to be offended. What we do need to do as Christians is to speak up about our failure to actually speak up. Uh, this is, gone, this is uh, your, many Christians will be very familiar with these, this scripture in 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Well, the people who are called by the name of God are believers, those are Christians, and we do need to humble ourselves and pray and seek God's face and turn from our wicked ways. We need to pray for our nations and for the whole world because lots and lots of babies are being aborted these days. Many Christians have actually said very little on the issue of abortion. In most churches, the abortions are not discussed. We do need to ask God's forgiveness. Can you imagine Jesus appearing in London today? What do you think he would do? Well, I don't know exactly what he'd do, but I think he would be, I don't think he would be silent on the abortion issue. He would actually have a great deal to say on the subject. I'm sure he would. I may be wrong, but I, I don't think I am. I think he would actually, I think he'd have a lot to say. So we need to repent about, Christians generally need to repent about our failure to actually talk and address this issue. We need to speak about the issue openly. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you are the salt of the earth, and if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out. We're supposed to be salty. We're also supposed to be the light of the world. Let's be light in a dark place. Let's be light in a dark place, and let's speak about this issue, but gently, politely, without accusing anybody of anything. We, li we live in a world of mass communication. I'm very fortunate that I've been off this facility in a fantastic television uh, studio to make this presentation. But we can use these, this media to, uh, to, to spread our thoughts around the world, but let's be polite and respectful. Please be wise and harmless. Jesus said in Matthew 10, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Wise as serpents, but be harmless. Just be gentle. And we will be persecuted. Jesus said, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I get lots of emails every day from all over the world, and I get some very rude emails about abortions. People don't like the way I, what I what I feel on this subject. And people are very, send very, very strongly worded emails to me. Try and support an organization which is genuinely opposed to abortion. Um, I have to say that's not easily done because there are many organizations who will actually get up and actually say um, what the Bible actually clearly teaches. However, um, do your best and try and find an organization that is genuinely opposed to abortion. Finally, abortion is not an unforgivable sin. 
Um, if anybody has had an abortion or been involved in any way, it is a forgivable sin because the blood of Jesus, his son, cleans us from all sin. Sometimes I give this, this teaching in large churches and large groups of women and men come to the front for ministry. There's not a problem. We confess our sins and the blood of Jesus cleans us from all sin because God loves us. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So this presentation was made in, in consultation with a uh, consultant gynecologist, Dr. Tahira Saleem, who's a very close friend of mine. She lives in Pakistan, where abortions are illegal. I live in the United Kingdom, where abortions are legal. You can get hold of Dr. Saleem um, at that email address, and she does speak for Women's Aglow all over the world. Um, if you want any more information on the subject, please visit my website, finalfrontier.org.uk. Free Christian teaching, and God bless you. God bless you. Please download the DVD and give it to anybody you like. It's free, and may be copied entirely free. God bless you. Thanks for listening, to the, thanks for listening and thank you for your time. God bless you. <laughs>